Theo, yeah, thanks a lot for doing the podcast. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. And we're in your offices in Wimbledon. Yep. And we have not got our professional equipment. No, you've cooked up. Yeah, we have. Um, but we're, do- we're doing it anyway. But apparently you were saying to me earlier, they are the best in their price range. They are, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And not a lot. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what I've done actually to hopefully make it a bit different is I've um, asked my community and some of my followers for questions they'd like to ask you because I thought it might be a bit different. You don't get the usual type of questions. Um, so first thing is, this is from Ben Alderton. And he's asked, how do you... Hello, Ben. Hey, Ben. Hey, Ben. Well done, Ben. There you go. Um, how do you value a business? But you, as in you. Wow. Okay, so it's really, really simple. Everybody values businesses differently. And you have to take some of your own values into that valuation. So if someone says, will you invest a pound in my business? My pound is worth the same as your pound. 100 pennies, it's one pound. So I should get back exactly one pound's worth of value, same as you. But if I've got something more to give to the business other than my one pound, then my pound is worth a hell of a lot more. So when people ask me to invest in their businesses um, and ask me for X thousand pounds, I expect those X thousand pounds to be more valuable than X thousand pounds coming from somebody else. And it's the same when I look at a business to buy outright. Someone might think it's worth five million pounds, 10 million pounds, 50 million pounds, whatever. For me, the basics are, what's it worth to everybody else? And then what's it worth to me? What can I add to that business that makes it more valuable? Now, I'm not going to pay somebody all the value I'm going to add to the business. That's where they get it wrong because they think I'm going to give them all my value, which is obviously ridiculous. Um, Why is it ridiculous? So I'm going to pay somebody for the my experience and my lifetime and everything I'm going to have to sweat to put into the business, I'm going to give them the value of it. Well, why bother then? Mm. Why not bother doing it? Yeah. So I'm never going to give them what I'm going to add to the business. I'm going to give them the same pound as everybody else mm. can give them, whatever that's worth. So that's how I value my businesses. And sometimes, very, very rarely, of course, um, I will give them a little bit more to get the deal Mm. of what I'm going to get, the synergies that my businesses may have with that business and the economies of scale. Mm -hmm. But just a teensy winter bit. Yeah. Because I don't want to work for somebody else. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, So it's quite common, I... Uh, help a lot of property investors get on the property ladder and get their buy to lets and often they don't have deposit so they're trying to raise money borrow a bit of money here and there and a common question for people like you is well how do I get started and raise money or pitch to people when I've got no money and no experience and I guess you must have seen some people like that on the dead so you're gonna pitch- that a dead horse before well I was, was going to say so <laughs> <laughs> you got no money no experience what are you adding well, I mean, I, I, I've got hundreds of properties and that's what I had when I started. Yeah, but you didn't, you didn't start with hundreds of properties, did no, you? No, I started with nothing. Exactly. Yeah. But you didn't start with hundreds. No. No, right. So what, when you've got no money um, and no experience, yeah. what are you adding to an investor? Mm. That was a question to you. Yeah. Ah, throwing it back on me. All right. Well, it, it's interesting here because this person who asked this question put... Is you. Uh, it, this isn't me. All oh, right, okay. No, no. Um, but they put, but brings passion, enthusiasm, and a great business idea. Oh, well, you isn't see, that the answer? Yeah, but you see, you never, you never gave me that bit. You no. see, so th- that's and that's exactly the answer I was looking for. Yeah. You've got to then sell me. If you've got no money and no experience, well, what are you adding? If yeah. you turn around and say, then the answer is, <laughs> bye. Yeah. Um, 
But you might turn around and say, I've got loads of common sense, I've got a great work ethic, I'm passionate, I'm enthusiastic, I learn quickly, and I'm going to help you make a lot more money than you've already got. Yeah. Now that might get my attention. Yeah. And you've worked with people like that before? Loads of times. Yeah. Um, and that's where you then feel, actually, I can now add something. Yeah. Something I'm very fortunate to have got through my lifetime experiences. Right. And it takes a lifetime, sadly, to get these experiences. Yeah. Um, I can add some of that experience to them and pass on that experience, mm. which hopefully will help them make more money, which means I make more money. So I think a lot of people, when they don't have the money, the experience, they lack the belief. Um, how can someone believe in themselves more to pitch their idea, to raise finance, etc.? Wow. Do you know what? If you lack the belief and lack the confidence, don't do it. Right. In fact, don't do it at all. Go and get a job. Because it's going to be a lot of tough times. But we all start lot- somewhere, don't we? Yeah. But go and get a job till you get that confidence and belief. Because right. if you haven't got the confidence and belief, you're likely to muck up. Yeah. So why do you want to go and muck up? You know, we, 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 when you're running your own business, there's going to be lots and lots of difficult times. Yeah. And you've, that's where you've got to draw on that inner strength and the belief and the confidence. And if you haven't got that, you are, you are going to struggle. Mm. So, you know, I, I love seeing people that are passionate and got belief and confidence. That doesn't mean, of course, they're guaranteed to succeed because it's still tough out there. Mm. But if you haven't got the basics, your chances of success are even less. Mm. And you said you've, unfortunately, it takes a lifetime to give you the experience that you can bring to people. What is that experience? What is the the lifetime? The lot, well, of course, the the great thing is, um, you've had a lifetime, you're a lot younger than me. I've had a lifetime. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, maybe a couple of years older than you. <laughs> so it's all a, a lifetime. Is all our lifetimes. Yeah. It's everybody's lifetime. Um, and you know, during that lifetime, we have different excuse experiences. Now, I've met loads and loads of people who said to me, "Theo, I've got thirty years of experience in this industry." What they really mean is they've got one years of experience times thirty. Mm. It's not actually very valuable to me. Yeah. Someone might have just been it five years, but it's actually it's had a whole lot of different things in that industry. And it's got a lot more experience, even though they've only done it for five years. Mm. Or they might have done one hour a week for 30 years. It's all relevant. Mm. Okay, thank you. I'll take another question now from our community. Now, um, we've got a few watch fans in our community. Oh, okay, dear, okay. I am one of them myself. Right. Um, and I believe your first job was Watches of Switzerland, was that it right? It was, and this is a very embarrassing evening for me. Uh, things have not... It's been one of those funny days today. Things have just not worked out. And I'm you, glad I'm not the only one. No, no, no. no. <laughs> and you get days like that. Yeah. So, I w- was running late this morning. Um, so I left the house very, very sharpish um, with Mrs. P. Maia. I mean, she was chasing me around the house, talking to me. In fact, I don't know if you can see it, but this area is bleeding, <laughs> right? And you just sit in the corner there, just bleeding. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, I wasn't listening to words she was saying because I was running behind schedule. Uh, and I was late for my appointment, which really annoyed me. Then I came to the office and the guy who was meant to come see me missed his train and was late for his appointment. Um, you've turned up. With no cameras. With no camera crew. Thanks for the reminder. Who are really late with their appointment. So it's been a really poor day. But it's only going to get worse. Because tonight I'm giving a talk in Henley. And it's been organised by two good friends of mine that run a watch business, Nick and Charles English, Nick and Giles English. Nick was on the show. Like oh, was he? Yeah, All right, yeah. Bremont. Yeah, yeah. And I've got loads of Bremont watches. Yeah, but not today. <laughs> so I'm going to their talk tonight. 
Where's my trusted high watch? <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> Sorry, Giles. Um, in fact, I might ring you up in a minute and ask you, could you put a spare one in your pocket and I'll swap over <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get there. And I promise to return it. Um, I wouldn't return it. Uh, so you best not give me one. Um, yeah, so I know it's going to go wrong even further today on watches. And watches is probably going to be a sore subject. Uh, so watches Switzerland, yep. You work, How was that job? And did that um, give you a, a, a sense of passion for watches and retail and everything else? It was my first retail job. <clears throat> and it gave me a big passion for retail and a massive passion for watches. And I have lots and lots and lots and lots of watches. And now and again... I'll, I'll swap over and take them out and then I forget that I even had them um, because you can only wear one. And this thing has just taken over my life because it does so many practical things. And I feel a bit of an idiot if I was wearing two. <laughs> yeah, you know. I have actually thought about that. I know. A nice looking watch and then a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe that's what's going to be a new fashion. Maybe we should, do, we should start it off. Maybe we should start wearing, you know, these electronic things on one hand and then a really lovely watch on the other and say... It could take off. It could take off. You've got to, you've got to wear two. I mean, who says? About it, 20 years ago, people would have said, you look stupid if you do that and take a photo of yourself yeah. in public. But people do. But now everyone does it. Yeah, so. exactly. So, um, so I did get the passion for watches and more so I got the passion for retail. Mm. And I knew I was home. I would, before that, I was doing... Uh, office-based jobs. I was a filing clerk at Lloyd's of London, uh, insurance brokers, and it didn't go well because I'm dyslexic. So why would you give a dyslexic loads of files to put away and then <laughs> expect to find them when you want them? <laughs> was it my fault, Gov? Hey. Didn't go well. So I, I, in fairness, life was really really bad i was probably at the lowest ebb of my confidence mm. i knew i was bright i left school with no qualifications i couldn't do the exams got a job and i was rubbish at it i got a job after lots of interviews by the way i must have gone done 30 interviews for jobs didn't get any of them so i took the one that got me a job and I was absolutely rubbish at it. And I start, I, the first time I started doubting myself about whether I was a fantasist, that I thought I was bright, but actually, I'm not. Mm. Um, and when that job came to an end, um, I was quite devastated, but it was never gonna succeed. Not if you can't put things in the right place. Um, but I did make good tea and I was very popular. So there were, in fairness, they were incredibly kind to me and um, said, you should start looking around <laughs> <laughs> rather than just fire me, um, which I did do. And got the job at Watcher Switzerland. Went for the interview on the Saturday. Uh, I was interviewed by a guy called Derek Jeeves, who I still keep in touch with. Um, and um, I shook his hand at the end, got up to leave. And I said, that you, you, you'll be writing to me? He says, uh, no. I went, what? Already, I screwed it up already. He said, um, you've got the job. When can you start? And that's never happened to me before. That had never happened to me before. But the fact that I walked in there on a Saturday afternoon, had an interview in a little room upstairs, he told me I'd got the job, just gave me so much confidence. First day there, uh, I knew I was home. Mm. I absolutely loved it. I loved talking to customers. I liked to learn. I loved the whole watch. Uh, watches, I always had a, a love for watches. I only had one, but I used to love them. Um, and uh, I just knew that was my home. That was my spiritual home. Mm. And it's retail's done you pretty well ever since. But if you, Bob, lost a few, Bob, yeah. uh, could have done a lot worse. Okay, could we talk about retail for a bit? Is that right? We can. Um, there's been a lot of questions. I don't know if I can name someone, but I will name Carl Simpson just so we've got someone. And that last question was from Connor, who's actually a watchmaker himself, Connor Stanage. Um, this one is from Carl. 
uh, what's the future of the high street? You must have been asked that a million times, but I would like to get that in. Um, what is the future of the high street and retail and how does e-commerce play into that in your view? Um, it's going to be tough. It is tough and it's going to remain tough. We are going through a structural change in the way the consumer spends their money. And at the moment, we're not dealing with it very well because we got a government that is totally paralyzed, complete paralyzed, three years of doing nothing um, other than bitch and bicker. They're an embarrassment to us all. And you know who you are. <laughs> Um, Point your finger at them. Yes. <laughs> you are embarrassing. Um, if you think three years in the life of technology, in the last three years, if you think of the technological uh, advances that have been made, and our government has done nothing, mm. zilch. I know the technological advances beforehand, and they're only getting faster because technological advances are doubling, Slow, doubles yeah. up. So the fact that they've done nothing about it means that retail is going through this transitional period. But it's more than transitional, it's structural. But it means it's going to have a crash landing because it has to change. Mm. It has to change. And technology tells you it has changed because consumer has decided they would rather spend their money in different ways and interact with you in different ways. And as retailers, I'm not, I'm, for the first time, I'm calling myself a retailer as opposed to a shopkeeper. I used to love being a shopkeeper. Um, we have to interact with those people in the way that they want to interact with us, being led by technology. And whereas before changing consumer habits was very, very difficult, it is now much easier because people have decided to have these things, phones, and it, they're used to it. So they're happy to adapt. Our government have got to legislate. They fail to legislate for the changes in technology. We're still paying taxes on the basis of what they were worked through in the 1500s. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't remember ever seeing the internet in the 1500s or an iPhone or an iWatch or technology as we got the streaming. So we've absolutely failed to collect the taxes that the country needs to thrive by our inaction, and in fact, levied more taxes on the share of the cake that's decreasing. You're not talk you're talking about Amazon here? Yeah? I'm not talking about Amazon, I'm, I'm just talking generally the way, I don't think it's fair because I think Amazon, love them, I hate them, and I do both as it happened, Mr. Amazon, I love you and I hate you, but that's <laughs> life. Um, they do a job. And the, 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 the demand, the exa exactly. Yeah. So there's no point in sitting here bitching about them. Yeah. But they're showing the way. Mm. So as a consumer spends the money in different ways, the exchequer's not getting their share. So they're deciding to take more of a share to the decreasing slice of the cake. Well, if you carry on like that, then the future of the high street and retail is... is, is pretty damning and at the moment um, I don't know when you go out when you go out when is this going out three three weeks time something like that okay well by that time three weeks time we will Nothing else would have happened. we will <laughs> well we might know who the leader of the Tory party is in three weeks time yeah. maybe or maybe not I don't know um, but whoever he is uh, whether it's uh, Jeremy Hunt or Boris Johnson, they've got to hit the ground running. But sadly, I know what their preoccupation is going to be. Brexit. So we'll be entering into the fourth year. In the meantime, 
the structural issues with our retail world it gets worse and worse and worse there'll be more crash landings and irreparable damage would have been done mm. so it sounds awful because it, it is awful in the sense that it is avoidable and could have been avoided um on the plus side we will survive yeah and some will some won't and new players will come into the market mm. but totally unnecessary mm. totally unnecessary what kind of moves models retail businesses do you think will survive what, what dna have they got about them that'll make them survive is it maybe a hybrid of online and, and physical? Or? I think there is definitely a value of online and physical, but I think the the point we've got to take into account is that the value of the physical will be very much in the as a service. Yeah. Um, and that's where the physical comes into it, and it will be less and less important. Mm. Uh, some of the numbers we are seeing at the moment are quite frightening. You know, the level of the business that's going online from our own business compared to our stores and actually taking business out of your stores and putting it online is not very profitable mm. because you've still got your fixed costs yeah. so then you have to shut your shops so you end up shutting shops mm. and it, it continues so um, not a great picture you know you are as a retailer going to be up to your elbows in muck and bullets mm. for a good few years yet yeah okay um, you've had a lot of experience in business and you have invested in and mentored a lot of people in business. So from your experience and watching them, what does it take to be successful in business? Uh, it's not one thing, as you quite well know. It's lots of things. We've touched on it before so many times. You know, you do need to have the drive, the passion, the ambition, the common sense, which is not common. You know what we call it, common sense. Um, the resilience to get up when you're down. Um, and the real win, the real will rather, to succeed. Now, add with all that, the ability to identify the right industry and the right business to enter in the first place. Mm. Mm. Something to think about. Um, have you got any sort of business models or niches or areas that you think are quite exciting. I'll give you an example. I'm doing a deal, we're talking about it, we're nearly there, of getting equity in a, a drones business. I'm really excited about that. I think that's where the future's going. I feel like Amazon could be delivering our stuff there. Have you got any insight into where you may think might go big? It's interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to switch that question over to you and ask you the question. What type, what, what the business that you're going to invest in, you call it a drone business, What's different about that business that's making you consider putting your hard-earned cash into it? So uh, it'll, it'll be an earning, so I won't be investing money, I'll be adding... Oh, one of those, is it? Yeah. You're, you're going to be adding your expertise. Yeah, yeah. So you, you sweat, to me like sweat value. Yeah. Sweat value, is it? <laughs> so you're going to oh, be adding judge. sweat value. You're going to put yeah, sweat value. So what's different about it then? Um, what's different about it is... Um, I just think that it's a space, the technology, which is going to become much more common. Be called a drone business. What does it do? Well, there aren't many of them about. What does it do? Okay, so they do security. Um, so they do... Um, so they use other people. They're not manufacturing drones. Uh, yeah. They are manufacturing drones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, no, they're not manufacturing drones. All right. Um, I didn't realise this was Reta my interview. We'll retake that. Yeah, we're going yeah. to no, cut that bit one out. We're going to cut that bit out. We can't because we haven't got all the fucking cameras here to do that. <laughs> so they're, they're but, not, they're using no. other people's drones. Uh, yes. Right. That they, makes more sense yeah. now. I was getting worried about yeah, you at that good, stage. Good, good. And so that they were... Thinking you lost the plot. Yeah, no, I often lose the plot. But So they would sell those drones to... They would sell drones and offer services to um, big manufacturers who want to use it for security, warehousing, you know, they, they use them to sort of keep an eye on, on the warehouse. They have big contracts with a lot of 
councils and companies who own huge amounts of land where it saves resource, manpower, etc. So they're offering services or the selling software or hardware? All of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe there are that many companies that even do that in the whole country that I've been led to believe. Um, yeah. And, and they're trying to find a way to get it to consumer and business. So I think in the future, there's quite a lot of people who just like flying them. Oh, I love my drone. Yeah. There's people who like, uh, who maybe want to set, set up a business around them, um, offering various services with their drones. For example, they have a training business which teaches people how to fly the drones. Costs a good few grand to get yourself trained up to, to fly them. So there's the kind of consumer and then business to business side. I probably haven't explained it all that well, but um, I'm excited about it. Well, I hope um, it's successful. Yeah. Uh, and for you, anything like that that excites you? Um, I'm always looking. Yeah. So if you've got anything that's going to be really exciting that I'm not going to get bored with, you've got my number. Um, I, I'm always looking. And, and quite rightly, I now uh, am in a fortunate position that I only invest in things that really do excite me, mm. that I think they're going to make me want to be involved. If I invest in something where I just put my pound in and and don't get a kick from it, then quite rightly, I should only get a pound's worth of equity. Yeah. Same as everyone else. Mm. But if I get something that excites me, that I want to be involved in, um, then I'll invest. And what does uh, excite you? Well, technology does. Yeah. Te technology always has done. Um, I've had a drone since they were really invented, yeah. quite frankly, and I always find it very exciting. I still can't see how we're going to... Um, use the drone to uh, deliver the much talked about delivery process even though we know that there's been all sorts of uh, uh, prototypes uh, trialed because um, there is some serious issues mm. uh, we still have, no one's it's like the elephant in the room no one is prepared to talk about them and deal with them mm. when it comes to drones and I saw Uber released a picture a couple of weeks back of their drone uh, vehicle that you could, that will fly from top of buildings. And, uh, you know, I thought, great. I, I saw that in the newspaper sitting on an aircraft. And I just got onto the aircraft. It was a, it was a commercial flight. I'd taken two and a half hours from the time I arrived practically just it's just under two and a half hours to actually rest my butt on that chair mm. and uber are going to put you in and out in four minutes get you on the plane and uh, get you on the drone and send you off and then the next lot would come on and i'm thinking well how, if they can do that why don't the airports do that mm. what are they going to do will we have to strip off or are we just going to allow everybody with whatever they have in their bags yeah. on a drone. How does that work? Mm. It will only take one lunatic to do something absolutely stupid that would close the whole network down. Mm. Yeah. So it wasn't addressed at all. It was just a shiny, big, human-sized drone. Yeah. Well, how is it going to work? Then you talk about deliveries. Are we really going to have drones buzzing up and down the road? In the air, yeah. Yeah, mm. above the road. Yeah. What happens when, if there's bad weather or there's an issue yeah. and one lands on somebody? Yeah. Takes a head off? Well, I guess it's similar with autonomous cars, isn't it? So, but so, it's, but we, it's we, coming, isn't yeah, it? Well, we say it's coming, but yeah. it's fine, it's coming. So is Christmas. <laughs> but the point is no one has sat down to explain where the flight paths are going to be. Yeah. Now, you could say, and I've thought about this myself, with canals, maybe, mm. where you can use it as a flight path because yeah. if something happens, goes into the canal. Don't get your delivery, obviously, but... It doesn't drop on someone's doesn't, head. Exactly, it doesn't take someone's head off. So yeah. there, is a, there is a positive side to this. Mm. Um, but then they don't go everywhere. Mm. And it's that last mile, isn't it? That, yeah. that is the last mile. They don't deal with the last mile, mm. which is what we want. Yeah. So are you saying that you think it's coming, but maybe not 
as quickly as we think. Or well, you're going into not? you're going into the drone business. You've not answered. What would you say? I would say I don't know the answer to those questions yet. Why? Because no one's answered them yet. And but yet we're talking about this is the solution. And there's people spending millions and billions of pounds. Isn't that how any industry starts? You don't have everything figured out. Well, the, you, well you, you have the main things figured out. You might not have all the technology figured out, but you've got the main. And this, to me, is, is, is a key point. Yeah. So we want, I think we're going to give a prize away to the first person, <laughs> right, who sends us a, a, a logical, serious answer how we're going to overcome this particular last mile mm. problem with using drones. Do you think maybe it's the it's just going to take a lot longer than we think. Because with autonomous vehicles, for example, there are cars that can drive that are way safer than people. But we're still probably 20 years, 30 years away from people not driving cars. Anymore. No, we're not. You think we're longer? I think we're a lot shorter. Oh, really? I am telling you, that's something different. You see, that's where I, I actually believe that is more viable. Yeah. And I actually would say it's going to happen in the next five years. Wow. And, you know, if we believe all the information um, that we've got, trials will start 2020. Yeah. The technology already exists. Uh, as you quite rightly say, it's safe for the most people. The key, of course, is when people do stupid, unexpected things and the computer takes over and crashes mm. because it will do, just like a human would. Will less people die? Well, if less people die on the roads, it means it's working. Mm. Well, we haven't eradicated people die, dying. We probably never will. And um, we can start suing the computers. Um, but I actually think there's, there's an excellent chance that that will happen in the next, not before five years. Wow, I'm very surprised. Before surprised. five years. Yeah. Is that an industry you're invested in or would like to be? It is an industry I'd like to invest in, an industry I've been looking at. Um, I looked at various things. It's the manufacturing of cars, quite frankly, is going to be secondary. It, it's the software here, and it's, it's your op the operating system as we know it. So we got iOS, we, we got Android, we got Windows, and all, all uh, lots of other operating systems. It's an operating system that will drive a car. That whoever licenses it got it. Are they going to license it out so you can go produce your car and just stick somebody's operating system and off it goes? Mm. Yeah. Or the other way around? Yeah. Right, you've got 10 minutes and I'm very aware of that. I'm not going to keep you any more time. So can we do a few quick fires? Quick fires. Is that all right? Great. So um, you're worth a lot of money. I won't say it because I think that's indiscreet. Um, and, and my missus might be She might listening be listening. Out. So that pound. What... Some upsides and downsides of being having good wealth. Listen, I've often said I started with nothing uh, and I've been very, very fortunate in life. I've worked hard, but I've had my breaks as well. And you need that. And the harder you work, surprisingly, you get some extra breaks mm. over and above the person that doesn't put as much effort in. Um, but starting with nothing, I'd say I would rather be rich and miserable than poor and miserable <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so where i'm having a bad day <laughs> i'd rather be rich and having a bad day than yeah. where i was before having a bad day yeah. so listen it, it's good to have money it's not everything your health is obviously absolutely paramount mm. your family is paramount uh, all these things are really come way before wealth yeah. if you've got it as well it's nice to have mm. does it make you happier a lot of people say oh well money doesn't make you any happier i was happier with money than without it if all other things were equal <laughs> personally exactly does it make you well, it gives its own problems doesn't it yeah. i mean the fact is whatever you do it, it, it creates its own problems whether you race cars race horses do things the other things you know it, they all come with their own problems yeah um and they're, they're different problems Mm, I think some people expect that money will get rid of them all, don't they? No, money doesn't get rid of all your problems at all. Um, it has its own. It deals with some and it creates others. Yeah. And we, we have to deal with them. Yeah. Okay. So we had this from Arabella Bailey. I think it's a great question. I've never had this before. Um, is there any one thing that someone warned you not to do that was probably a bad idea, but you did it anyway? 
Great question, Arabella. Um, <laughs> lots of times. <laughs> I think I've no, that's a great question. I'm just thinking, and a couple of things are coming to mind. Yes, I have. And what you now are going to ask me, if you were here, Arabella, would be, well, what was the outcome? And I'm going to say to you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So take heed when someone says that. Uh, sometimes it's worked out, uh, uh, but other times it, they were absolutely right. But I still did it. But it's yeah. about the risk-reward ratio. You then say to yourself, if it goes wrong, what's the, you know, what's the downside? Yeah. If it's you will lose X thousands of pounds and it's not going to change your life, then you might take the risk. Mm. If the downside is it's going to bankrupt you, you're, you're not going to do it. Mm. So it's that risk-reward ratio. And that's the way I've looked at it. And sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, you were obviously big in the public eye in Dragon's Den. Um, I think it's assumed you're not so much anymore, but that may not be the case. But this is from Viv Krask, who's asked, do you miss being in the public eye less now that you've left the den? Um, I... I mm Left the Denks, I did eight or nine years. I can't remember now, but it was great fun. It's fantastic. I loved every minute of it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's time to move on and get your kicks elsewhere. Uh, public eye, people at the public have been brilliant to me, very polite as always. Um, it's been great. I don't feel I'm any less in the public eye. I still get stopped to send them at the times in the street but people want to talk to me I've done lots of other things after Dragon's Den on television so that that side hasn't really changed um, and I just take it in my stride it's not it's not an issue one way or another do you like being in the public eye um, I'm gonna I can't remember who said it but um, I'm gonna repeat it and and it goes something like I, I would rather people wanted to know who I was than didn't want to know who I was. Mm. Enough said. Um, would you ever be a football chairman again? This is from Paul um, Stevens. And, you know, how was it like being a football chairman? What did you learn? Paul Stevens, not yeah. Keith Stevens. He, no. was, he was one of my managers at Millwall. <laughs> um, and a legend of a player, third and a half. Uh, great guy. Um, it was great fun. Uh, I mean, it was... Good, the bad and the ugly of using that saying again you know we had some incredible highs and some incredible lows mm. uh i did that for eight, eight years of my life it's a common thread coming through here <laughs> yeah. um and i wouldn't change it for the world i'm so pleased i did it even with the highs and the lows mm. uh, they came it, with the highs it profitable? um it wasn't profitable it's not you know the old saying how do you make a small fortune in football start with a big one <laughs> um but I would do it all over again. For yeah. me, it was the most amazing uh, eight years. Mm. Where, whether I would do it now at my age, I was very young when I did it. Um, I don't know. Never say never. I haven't had the urge yeah. to do it. So uh, the fact that I've not had the urge to do it, why well, I haven't done it. Yeah. Okay. Best advice you ever received? Best advice I ever received. Um... I won't go through my school reports. <laughs> um, I think it's that old adage uh, about uh, cash flow. And we're talking about business here. So, uh, and, I, and it's the one I like to uh, pass on, really, is you can survive as a business with a lack of profit. It's lack of cancer. It will kill you eventually, but slowly. A lack of cash flow is like a heart attack. It just wipes you out. So I would say to everybody out there in business, make sure you've got enough cash flow. You can survive not making money as long as you can pay the bills till you start making money. But you can't survive if you can't pay the bills. So cash flow. Okay. Worst advice you ever received? Don't buy rhyme in the stationers. <laughs> um, it's that's true. It's true. Don't buy 
it, the world of the paperless office, this was in the mid 90s, the, the world of the paperless office is upon us, there's no future for them. That was in 95. Can you remember he said that? Oh, or was it everyone said that? No, 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 no. Oh. A couple of people said it. I can definitely remember who said it. <laughs> uh, and um, does it feel good to make uh, them wrong? Oh well, well, I've met them so subsequently, several times subsequently, and have reminded them <laughs> of that. Just and it's now becoming a bit of a standing joke yeah. that even they say it before I do. <laughs> Great. Um, so two more then. Um, one is, is there anything in the world that you believe is really wrong that you would like to see changed or you'd like to change yourself? Oh, oh well, there's, there's the whole raft of things that we'd like, you know, you know, the injustices of the world, the famine that goes in the world, the deaths that go in the world. I mean, if you had a magic wand, wouldn't, wouldn't everybody go to those straight away? Mm. Um, so those are the things that, you know, we talk about climate change. Uh, we talk about it. It is a serious issue. Um, but there's lots of other serious issues yeah. out there that we seem to be able to turn our back on um, and not deal with because it's not convenient. Mm. It's not convenient for our governments to do anything about it. And it's, in some cases for us, it's far away. So... Yeah. Easy. E easy to uh, ignore. So th there is some burning injustices that need to be dealt with. Um, and of course, uh, politicians. Are we dealt with politicians I knew today? this was coming. I knew this was coming. Get a grip. <laughs> what the hell are they doing to our country? Yeah. Torrid. Mm. Torrid. You've got another meeting, so we better not go down that uh, rabbit hole. Exactly. Um, so this podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. I um, want to thank you very much for taking your time. You're welcome. It. I think it's been great, and I think our listeners are going to get a lot of value. Um, what does the word disruptive mean to you? Um, not the norm. Uh, moving people uh, or things away from the norm and doing things differently. Mm. And that is more important and relevant today than at any time in our history yeah okay thank you now finally um where should we follow you and what are you what ventures are you doing what, what do you promote at the moment we did we, we talked about a couple of things at the start didn't well we? you can yeah obviously um i'm on twitter you can find me on twitter Is it just your full name yeah my name on twitter yeah. theo Perfetis. uh you can find me on instagram you can find me on facebook uh and if you can't find me on any of those three you shouldn't be doing it anyway because obviously who are you uh, yeah, yeah. exactly um and uh things that we're doing obviously i support small businesses i've got a network of two and a half thousand small businesses that we started uh god knows how many years ago now i can't remember i've been to eight uh, again nine uh, nine this year it must mean we're coming to an end you have an eight year itch yeah you? exactly <laughs> um sbs um uh, small business sunday yeah. Uh, which is on Sunday on my, on my Twitter account. And if you can't find it, you won't know about it. But if you look at my Twitter account, every Sunday I retweet uh, six small businesses to everybody else uh, that have taken my fancy. And we get thousands of entries every Sunday. And we create a community of small businesses that support each other. We have events, we have conferences, we have website, self-help groups. Um, and it's trying to help those really small micro businesses in some cases you might be just you in a back bedroom or you could have 10 15 20 employees mm. but it's about joining everybody together and talking about the things that matter and this is all free by the way so there's no cost um, and giving guidance and the ability to get together annual conference and sub conferences through the year yeah. um, to um, get help and grow those businesses because having a small business can be incredibly lonely. So you need other people to talk to. They've got the similar issues, similar problems, and in quite a lot of cases, have have already overcome them, and they can help you overcome them a lot quicker. Theo, for your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.